Welcome to the strange but true story of Tiki, a pop culture phenomenon that swept America in the early 1950s, leaving in its wake a legacy of hula girls and Hawaiian shirts, tropical drinks, and suburban paganism. For some, Tiki represents one of the great lapses of common sense and good taste in recent history. For others, it stands as a noble attempt by a modern man to recreate paradise in his own backyard. Either way, the story of Tiki is the story of how post-war America went totally coconuts. The Tiki culture and the American culture really intermeshed in the 1950s for a couple of reasons. And one of them had to do with the fact that there's so many people coming back from World War II who had been stationed in that area. And it actually had some more or less direct experience with the culture. Some of the fiercest fighting of World War II was centered in the South Pacific. But for many of the young Americans stationed on such exotic islands as Bora Bora and Oahu, the Polynesian lifestyle, and especially the Polynesian women, helped make the bloodshed bearable. One such American was James Michener, a naval officer who immortalized his wartime experiences in tales of the South Pacific. I wrote it with one clear object in mind. I don't give a damn what the guys say now about bitching and complaining. When they look back upon these years, a decade or two down the line, they're going to realize that this was the great adventure of their lives. The novel, which won a Pulitzer Prize in 1947, was transformed by the songwriting team of Rogers and Hammerstein into one of Broadway's most popular musicals. A film version followed, and Polynesia was now enshrined as Bally High, an all-singing, all-dancing, Technicolor paradise. <laughs> That's it. Dance it up, kids. Polynesia was something else. Bora Bora, these kids knew what they were doing when they didn't want to go home to <clears throat> Oklahoma and West Virginia when you could stay in Bora Bora. <laughs> they weren't dumb. When it became a musical and later on a movie, the sort of hardship of the war sort of fell behind and the romance was embellished. And that really captured the imagination of the whole world because it had just come back from the trauma of the Second World War and was longing for some romance and for some pacifist adventure. This call to adventure was answered in 1947 by a Norwegian anthropologist named Tor Heyerdahl. In order to prove his theories of ancient Polynesian migration, Heyerdahl crossed the Pacific on a balsa wood raft, which he named the Kontiki. After sailing for over three months, the Kontiki finally reached a small island near Tahiti. Heyerdahl's best-selling account of the journey reinforced America's South Seas fantasy and inspired a generation of armchair explorers. America is very receptive to pop heroes, and Thor Heyerdahl was definitely a pop culture hero of its time. Every man and child knew about him. So in America, people used it for all kinds of purposes. Restaurant tours used it as names for the restaurants. It was, in fact, through Polynesian-themed restaurants that tiki style first infiltrated the American psyche and stomach. It was the, probably the, the precursor to what we think of as dining as entertainment. You walked off the street and it looked like a gigantic hut. It was basically a restaurant, but the thing that it had that other places didn't have is the fantasy that you were sitting with your family in some hut in the middle of the Pacific. The popularity of places like this and, and drinks like this um, had a lot to do with the fact that this was a way of, for two or three dollars, being able to get a little bit of a taste of that, that culture. 
Princess Bukuli has plenty for fire. She loves to give them away. Tiki cuisine was really nothing more than Chinese food served up in a tropical setting. But then again, eating wasn't the point. Mixing Caribbean and Polynesian ingredients, America reinvented the cocktail. These innocent looking yet potent concoctions with names like the zombie or the scorpion were the fuel that fed tiki culture and provided the perfect antidote for repressed Americans in the 1950s. She may give you the fruit, but she hangs onto the root. Now she has the fruit and the root. That's food. sweet. When I grew up in the valley in, in L.A. when I was a kid, my parents had these uh, backyard tiki parties like luau's. You had to have the total experience. You had to have the drinks and music and the decorations. It was like a total exotic experience. That was why uh, Martin Denny was so uh, popular. This is Martin Denny, the undisputed king, or big kahuna, of the tiki sound. Well, and he went so on and so forth. <laughs> and that was the beginning of, of the sounds, the exotic sounds of Martin Denny. Martin Denny, who performed almost exclusively in the hotels and restaurants of Waikiki, topped the American charts with his first album, appropriately entitled Exotica. His arrangements were like a lush tropical cocktail, blending a variety of ethnic ingredients, but somehow producing a unique new American sound. The album notes for one of his early successes, Hypnotique, were written by James Michener. Martin Denny made Hawaii a very popular commodity and of course it would sound something like this my music is fictional but it's based on different ethnic sounds and instruments it was sort of all make-believe type of thing uh, uh, fiction it's what people uh, think the islands might be like in their own mind <laughs> Exotic sounds of Martin Denny provided the glue for this artificial environment. These bird sounds and monkey chattering, uh, the sound of rumbling volcanoes and surf crashing really put everything together into a almost psychedelic experience. Denny admits that his most celebrated musical trademark, the exotic bird and animal calls, were discovered by accident. It was a pond right outside, right near our stage, and there were some of these buffos, large frogs. And uh, one night I was playing there, and I noticed that they were croaking all through the performance. Some of the boys in the band got carried away and started doing bird calls. The following day, somebody walked up to me and said, Mr. Denny, would you do that arrangement with the birds and the frogs? <laughs> I thought, well, what is he talking about? But I suddenly realized he had a point. Martin Denny helped spawn a new wave of exotic, erotic sounds, best described as pagan pop. And by the early 1960s, the song titles and album covers were growing more and more suggestive. Tiki music and tiki culture had become so synonymous with sexual liberation that even Hugh Hefner himself, on his weekly television program, decided to throw a Playboy-style luau. Well, hi, come on in. Well, hello and welcome to the Playboy Luau, a kind of a special evening. I'm Hugh Hefner, your host. This is Barbie and Lorelei. You've got a lay for our guest. Throw a 
half-naked Samoan male fire dancer in there covered with sweat and grease and, and thrill those white women from the Midwest who are terrified. Well, all of that has, of course, to do with sexual repression. Uh, the Samoan fire dancer is for the, the women, the repressed women, and these beautiful hula girls who become ever more skimpily attired in Waikiki are for, are for these repressed men. Whenever you're watching a hula girl dance, you better be careful, she's tempting romance. Don't keep your eyes on her hips, her Nazi hula hips. Keep your eyes on her hands. All of that goes into this repulsion and attraction that the West has for dark-skinned, beautiful Native people. The Native has always been this romanticized opposite, this alluring Native female out there, sort of like, like a siren bringing in all of these men that are so repressed and are running away from their wives. And what better way to get away from your own complicity, your own uh, agreement, than to say, the Native made me do it. <laughs> she was so beautiful and so enticing, I lost my mind. I didn't know what I was doing. Well, there's a long tradition of uh, a free life in the South Pacific. Go back to Captain Bly and Fletcher Christian. It was the same factor there. The stereotype of the South Seas maiden had had been perpetuated ever since the islands had been discovered. I call it uh, a National Geographic eroticism that that they were able to accept, you know, nudity in the context of native women because they were noble savages. We Britishers are supposed to be so reserved. I went to one of those ho oh, oh, la layers, learned to do a jolly good hula too, you know. I think fun's in the air, blown in by the trade winds. People who are bending under the weight of capitalism, very puritanical sexual mores, can find release from this. And that's what we are. We're the release for the Western world. Here you can quote unquote go native, which means go crazy with your sexuality. If Americans saw tiki as a symbol of sexual salvation, they weren't that far from the truth. The original tiki was more than just the mythical founder of the Polynesian people. He was considered a priapic demigod, the embodiment of procreative power. It's quite obvious it's a, f a phallic symbol. And although we all know that the size of your tiki is not the most important factor, um, again, it, it does impress to have a, a sizable idol in your front or backyard. People in America never really read the original myths, and they sort of have this like plastic tiki idea. It's kind of interesting because like people took this idea of tiki, which was really someone's god at one time, and they would make it and it would just be like a backyard planter decoration and they had no idea of what the original myths were and what tiki did and no one really cared it just became like this icon i went to tonga and i was trying to find a tongan tiki image so i was looking around at all these little shops and so forth and I saw that no one was carving the original Tongan image, and all they were carving was, was this like Hawaiian style. And I asked them, you know, you're in Tonga, how come you're carving this Hawaiian image? And he said, this is the one that the tourists most buy, so this is the one that we carve. <laughs> 